OK, so this is going to be a quick one, a seed of an idea rather than a fully fleshed out essay. But I was recently re-watching Antonioni's blow up for a different video, and I was surprised to find that the ending of that film actually reminded me of the ending of Blue Velvet. And if you've seen those two films, you might think that's a strange connection to draw, but hear me out. For those who don't know, Blow Up goes something like this. After our photographer Thomas spends an entire day investigating the murder he believes to have accidentally caught on camera, he returns to the supposed scene of the crime, only to find that the body, which he saw the night before, isn't there anymore. On his way out of the park, he sees a group of mimes miming a game of tennis. These are the characters we saw in the opening sequence of the movie. They seem to signal a kind of change, a shift, a new wave of something different passing through 60s London. After watching for a while, the mimed ball is launched out of the tennis court, and the mimes ask Thomas to go get it. He eventually goes along with the game, picking up the ball and throwing it back into the court, after which the camera sticks to his face as he continues to watch the exchange, and we start to actually hear the tennis ball, the back and forth, as if it were real. Now, Blow Up is sometimes considered the quintessential modernist film, probably because it's a pretty iconic depiction of 60s mod culture. But I would argue that with this ending, it also becomes the quintessential shift to postmodernism film, in my view. Because this ending doesn't simply follow in the alienated, detached, and narratively confused steps of his previous films, as well as the other classics of modernist cinema, like Hiroshima Mon Amour or Last Year at Marienbad, it in fact goes a step further, embracing a new kind of narrative. And this also reminds me of Jacques Rivette, in whose films we can find a similar thematic interest. In fact, you could argue that all of Rivette's films deal with this shift I'm talking about. He's obsessed with the act of creation. Theatrical rehearsals, plays within plays, metafictional narratives being imposed onto and becoming indistinguishable from reality. For example, in the whimsical Celine and Julie go boating, our two protagonists find themselves involved in the plot of a seemingly fictional reality they travel to after ingesting magical candy, and they eventually return to reality with one of the characters from the fiction, blurring the line between the two. The main characters in Le Pont du Nord come across a map of Paris that is in some way connected to a conspiracy. They project onto this map the logic of a children's game. Each square corresponds to a location in the game. The labyrinth, the well, the graveyard, the bridge, these fictional locations in the game become transposed onto the real Paris. And his later film, The Story of Marie and Julien, seemingly ends with a ghost returning to life, becoming real again. While most filmmakers try to make you forget you're watching a movie, I think that with Rivette's films, it's good to remember that it's all fake. It only adds an additional layer of metatextual meaning that goes hand in hand with the themes his films usually deal with. Rivette's interest in the game of fiction, the game of creation, is certainly reminiscent of Blow Up's ending, where Thomas chooses to play the postmodern game, rather than denying the simulacra and returning to his futile attempts at discovering the supposed underlying truth of the situation, he embraces the metafictional game. And for those of you who made it through Rivette's 13-hour masterpiece, Out One, you may be reminded of the long theatrical rehearsal scenes. However, I think that the ending of Blue Velvet goes even further into this postmodern shift, and tells us a lot about David Lynch's particular view of things. Blue Velvet is a coming-of-age journey through the darkness that underlies the quiet suburban life of our main character Jeffrey. This journey begins with the fall of the family patriarch, after which Jeffrey must confront the shadow of the adult world if he is to properly integrate it now that the father figure is no longer there to protect him. There he finds the underworld, one of sex, crime, and violence, which for the most part is associated with masculinity, the negative, toxic kind. 
Jeffrey has to battle this masculinity in order to become the positive masculine entity rather than its mirror opposite, which we see in Dennis Hopper's character, a kind of Freudian mess of outward sexual aggression and repressed Oedipal complexes. Oh, oh mommy, mommy, mommy. And so this journey is one of healthy integration of the masculine identity, a reappraisal of the quiet surface world through a confrontation with the dark side that underlies it and perhaps even upholds it. And when the battle is won, Jeffrey emerges as a hero and his father returns. It's something of a mesh of Jungian Gnosticism and Lynch's particular brand of surrealism. And while the final scene of the robin holding the black beetle in its beak, symbol of love defeating the symbol of darkness, that appeared in the opening scene of the movie as a terrifying evocation of this dark underbelly we're about to explore, while this may seem like a fairly straightforward encapsulation of the narrative arc I described, and thus a perfectly symbolic image with which to end the movie, there's something slightly off about it, because the bird is quite obviously fake, mechanical. So what exactly is Lynch saying here? Is he implying that this optimistic resolution is artificial, that it's not what it seems, and that the viewer should perhaps question this superficial joy that the tone of the scene implies? Or is Lynch saying that we should embrace the fake bird of love, embrace the simulacra, in my opinion, it's quite clearly the latter. What once was a naive peace and joy is now an informed peace. We understand that these traditions and conventions are not what we were once told they are. At heart, I think Lynch is a nostalgic. His films are obsessed with movies, the magic and simulacra of Hollywood. And I don't think that the creepy undertones of that final scene bother Lynch at all. Quite the opposite. This bird is that nostalgic reconstruction. So perhaps this is even closer to a kind of metamodernism, or post-postmodernism, or whatever you want to call it. It seems like Lynch believes, or at the very least this is the arc he's laying out in the movie, that it's okay to embrace the conventions once you've undergone the journey of deconstructing them and seeing the darkness that underlies them. In fact, the closing shots of the film mirror the opening. It's a kind of reverse matrix, if you will. So whereas in something like Vertigo, Hitchcock cannot avoid a kind of Hollywood moralism by having his main character's obsession with simulacra lead to a tragic ending, Lynch sees the reassuring, transcendent beauty in the simulacra, and just goes along with it. He simply plays the game. <laughs> 